my name is Michelle Forward. I'm a grad student in linguistics, um, and I love languages and maps, which is why I put together this thing. So it's um, a linguistic street map of Singapore. So every street is color coded according to the language of origin of the street name. Um, so th um, this is what we're going to build today. What I used to build it was um, data from OpenStreetMap. I uh, used GeoPandas to manip manipulate the data. Um, Scikit-learn to predict the classification of the street names, and uh, Talmil to make the map. And today's talk will be mostly focused on Scikit-learn building a baseline classifier and trying to figure out ways to improve over that baseline. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the lessons I learned from building um, this, um, from building these classifiers, um, your results on your own data sets. You know, just like machine learning in general, these results may not generalize to, to your uh, context. So. Um, so let's talk about why I wanted to build this in the first place. So if you've ever been to Singapore, you'll see that the street names are really, really diverse. Um, so I have some pictures of, this is a, obviously a Scottish name, uh, this is a Malay name, this is of Chinese origin, and I, I don't have photos of these because I haven't been back home. Um, recently, but there's like Arab names, I think this is a Jewish name, and this is an Indian name. So there's really names from a lot of different ethnic origins. Um, so why is that? So um, in case you didn't know, <laughs> Singapore is at the southern tip of the Malayan Peninsula. Um, it's on the shortest sea path between India and China. Um, it was an important trading port um, in the 14th century uh, based on archaeological uh, evidence, we know that. Um, but it was probably uh, important even earlier. So um, um, Ptolemy and his ge Geographia um, had a town called Sabana that was like a trading port at the southern end of what would have been the Malayan Peninsula. And this was in the first century AD. So um, assuming this was Singapore, it, it's been around for a while. Um, so that's the next um, entry of Singapore into cartography. A cartographic history is when Emerald Zhengha um, of China sailed to Africa and India and um, passed by Singapore. And this is actually an excerpt from his navigational charts, and it contains um, this landmark, which was um, the Dragon Tooth Gate, which is, was an navigate, important navigational landmark for people, um, for seafarers entering Singapore waters. Um, I'm, Skipping on, t so, okay, so at, at, at about this time, there was a Chinese traveler who passed through Singapore and reported that it was mostly inhabited by uh, the indigenous Malays. And also, um, there were a few Chinese planters living there. Um, and like I said before, it was an important port in the 14th century, but um, around, I think, the 16th or 17th century, it was sacked by the, um, by the Portuguese, and it became this sort of sleepy fishing village. Um, which made it um, sort of ripe ground to take over when the British arrived in 1819. So Stanford Raffles um, was looking for a port in Southeast Asia to challenge the growing might of um, the Dutch in the area. And he found Singapore. Um, he signed a, an agreement with the local chieftain to, um, to, uh, create, to, to start a port there. And... Um, once the British started this port, um, people started coming in from all over. So um, by far the most people came from South China. Um, also there were people moving down from Malaya, uh, people from Java, Sulawesi, and Indonesia, what is now Indonesia, um, from India, South India, and also from, uh, from Europe. So people of all these ethnic origins came to Singapore. And they settled in these, um, in these ethnic enclaves in Singapore that were designated by the authorities. So for example, on this map here, you can see there's a European town here, and there's a Bugis Kampong here that would have been settled by Malays. And so the people came, they settled in these ethnic enclaves, they brought the names with them, and they gave them to the roads that they lived on. Okay, so I'm fast forwarding through a lot and a lot of history here. Through World War II, um, um, Singapore became independent from uh, from the British in 1963 and from Malaysia in 1965. Um, and one of the first challenges that the um, 
that the new government had was um, a huge housing crisis. They couldn't, couldn't house everybody. There were, just weren't enough homes. So they undertook this really um, um, ambitious building program and built a whole lot of um, housing estates um, around Singapore. And the in interesting thing about these housing estates is that um, there's ethnic quotas on how many people of each race live there, so there has to be a minimum number of minorities in each, in each housing estate. As a result of this, because 90% uh, of Singaporeans now live in these, um, in these uh, public housing towns, um, Singapore has become very ethnically homogenous. But the road names um, that people gave to these places when they first arrived still remain ethnically um, heterogeneous. So this is an area of uh, Singapore that uh, actually I'm from. And you can see that all of the road names in this area are of British origin, right? So these are all like British counties. Okay, so what I wanted to do was to, um, to instead of just you know, looking at the map and trying to say, okay, here's a little British spot here, here's a little Chinese cluster here, I just wanted to plot everything on a map once so that I could look at it on a grand scale. So that was what I wanted to do. So, um, where I got the data from was from OpenStreetMap. In particular, um, there's these metro extracts for um, big cities around the world. And um, I downloaded the Singapore um, uh, street data. Uh, it came in GeoJSON format. GeoJSON is basically just JSON, except that it has this uh, geometry um, thing. So this could be a point. Um, in the case of roads, it would be a line string. And the coordinates um, dictate sort of like how the line goes. Um, so, um, how, how do we manipulate this data? So, I use GeoPandas, um, which is a variant of pandas that basically um, can do a lot of stuff with GeoData. So, um, it knows how to open GeoJSON files just like that. And so, I opened this file and I looked at the number of roads and it was 59,218. And that seems a little bit weird because Singapore is really small, so it's just 660 square kilometers. So um, why are there so many roads? So um, with a single line, you can actually plot um, what's going on in the ge geometry of geopandas. And what it turned out, so Singapore is just this diamond shape here, um, is that we're getting a lot of data from Malaysia and Indonesia. And um, so what I wanted to do was to only take those roads that were within the Singapore administrative boundaries. And this is, again, really easy with geopandas. So um, I just got the... Um, the administrative boundary shape um, from a different file. And, um, and you can actually just say, take the roads uh, whose geometry is within the Singapore geometry, and you get the right shape in the end. So GeoPandas is an amazing tool. If you work with GIS data, um, I recommend checking it out. OK, so, so at this point, we, had, um, we have just the Singapore roads, and I did um, a further amount of filtering and cleaning. Um, and I think I was left about 3,000, but uh, I wanted to go a little bit further because there's actually a lot of repetition in the data. Um, so these are all individual street names in, um, in a particular part of Singapore. And you can see that the urban planners were really like creative when they got to this area. Um, you know, they really busted out the thesaurus on this one at least. Um, <laughs> so, so basically everything around here is called Lentor except for these two streets here. And um, instead of classifying each of these streets individually, I just wanted to, to do that, um, you know, treat all these as one, because these are all obviously of a single ethnic origin. So um, I just wrote a function that did that to extract out the names, and then we got down to 1,711. Okay, so um, at this point, a normal person would have sat down and started, um, you know, classifying them by hand, but... Um, instead, I busted out scikit-learn. So, um, so this was my plan. So what I wanted to do was to take, uh, was to hand code 10% of the data, and then I would train a classifier based on this 10% of the data, um, use it to predict the labels of the next 10% of the data, and then um, I would have like, tw um, and then I would hand correct that, and then I'll have 20% of the data that's like, you know, properly. Um, 
properly coded, and I could use that to train again. And then, so like in this iterative cycle, hopefully the classifier getting better and better. That was the idea. Um, so this is an example of um, supervised classification. Um, so let me just go through this really quickly, since I think most people know what this is about. So um, our roads are going to be rows in um, this feature matrix. And we're going to extract out features which have to be numerical um, based, on, based on each road name. Um, we also have uh, this wide train feature vector, uh, vector which is going to be um, basically labels for each road. So, so for example, this road is Malay, it gets the label zero. Um, based on this X train and Y train, we're going, the classifier will learn a, a mapping uh, M between X train and Y train. Now we have another data set that's called, uh, so another set of roads that we don't yet know the labels of, right? So this is our testing data. And um, we extract out the same features based on this. And we can apply the same mapping M that we learned from X train and Y train to X test to get the predicted set of labels. And then we can compare that with the, um, with the true labels to see uh, how well we did. So this is how supervised classification goes. So what we need to decide now is, um, so we already know our roads. We already know, uh, we've had to figure out what the set of labels is we're going to consider. We need to figure out what our uh, um, features are. And we need to figure out how we're going to learn the mapping M. So the first thing is to uh, establish a classification schema. So I chose this. So these are the four main so the ethnicities that were represented in the, uh, in the data. Um, generic is something like, um, like things like Market Street or Temple Street, where even though it's an English word, it's, it's clearly not reflecting this British origin. It's just to describe something about the area. And other is basically all the other ethnicities. So, um, the next thing we need to do is to split our data into the X train and Y train. Um, so you can do that with um, the train test split function in scikit-learn. Um, and then we need to decide on the features. So this is an example of language classification. And um, probably the most common set of features that you use in language classification is going to be character n-grams. So this is a um, so shifting, overlapping, um, um, Section of like one character will be um, just unigrams, two characters will be bigrams, and three characters will be trigrams. So those are those were the things that um, I selected as the features. And Scikit-Learn has um, has a, uh, has classes to do all this um, counting for you, the n-gram counts for you. So um, that's just count vectorizer, and you give it the number of n-grams you want. So this is, I think, one, two, and three. And we're going to do it on a character-by-character -character basis. OK? And then we can, um, so we can use that n-gram counter and um, fit transform the data, which is the road names. Um, and this gives us our NumPy uh, feature matrix, x-chain. And we do the same thing with the test data to get x-test. Okay, so next thing we need to do is figure out how to, um, is to figure out how we're going to learn that mapping. So um, scikit-learn has this really useful um, flowchart to figure out which classifier to use. So if we just go from the start, um, do we have more than 50 samples? Yes, we do. Um, are we predicting a category, i.e. is this classification or regression? Um, is classification, so we move here. Do you have labeled data? Is it supervised or not? Yes, it is, so we move here. Is it less than 100K samples? Yes, it is. So um, we're going to try using linear SDC. Okay. So um, building the classifier is really easy. So we just um, say classifier equals linear SVC. And then we fit that to the train X train and Y train. And it learns that um, mapping or the model M. Um, Next thing we need to do is to decide on the evaluation metric, how we're going to determine how well the, um, how well the, the model does. So um, this should be based on what your downstream, um, uh, what you're going to do with the data after you've classified it. So what I was going to, to do was to individually um, so like alter the things that were incorrect. So what, uh, so what I want to minimize is the number of errors. 
So um, in other words, what I want to maximize is the accuracy score. So I pick accuracy score as my uh, metric. So now we test the classifier. So we, we want to get the um, predictions of the model, the, the predicted labels. Um, so we just apply the model that we learned before, um, call the predict method on it, apply it to X test, and we get Y test. And then we can compare uh, that Y test to the true, uh, the true labels um, that I hand coded. And what we got, what I got in the initial thing was 0 0.56. Okay, so that's 56%, that's 34% of the things that I would have to hand code and, um, um, you know, hand, change by hand. So this, is, this doesn't sound really great. Um, on the other hand, it's, much, it's doing much better than chance. So, so there's about six labels, so maybe, so a completely random classifier would only get 16%, right? So, um, so we're doing quite a bit better than that, but we want to improve. So how can we improve? So um, looking back at this diagram again, what can we change? So one thing we can change is the number of rows we have. So we can change the amount of training data. We can also change um, the features that we use. Um, and we can change how the mapping is, is performed. So in other words, we can add more training data. We can experiment with other classifiers. Um, we can add more features. Or we can prune the features. Um, and another thing we can do is to tune the hyperparameters of the classifiers. Okay, so the first thing that I tried because it was the uh, easiest, and this is sort of like a post hoc analysis after I'd gone through all the data, um, was to see what are the effects of data and classifier type. So, um, so you can't really see the labels, but um, what I was expecting was that linear SVC is sort of a simple model. Um, I was expecting it to do pretty well on, the, um, on a small amount of training data. But as we added training data, I expected more powerful models to do better than it. But actually, that wasn't the case. So the, the top one is actually linear SVC, and it's basically the best throughout. Um, more powerful models that I expected to do better, such as random forest. Um, we're actually like down here at the bottom. It um, never really got going at all. Um, so that was sort of surprising. Um, another thing to notice is that, you know, as we go from left to right, the amount of the accuracy does go up. But sometimes, you know, it goes down, which is a little bit weird. Um, so the lessons learned from this is that the more data, the merrier, uh, mostly. Um, so one thing that it would be good to do when, if, you're doing, if you're thinking about adding more data is to actually plot how, what the effects of, of adding more data have been so far and um, just monitoring to see that it's, it's actually increasing. Um, what, something that's quite common is that you have start to plateau out after, after a while. Um, and, and so if you, st if you still insist on adding more data, then you're not going to get very much bang for your buck. Um, so, um, Plotting the sort of um, um, accuracy lines is, is a good thing. Okay, um, so why do the powerful models not do so well? So um, it's generally said that powerful models need a lot of data. So maybe it was just the case that, you know, with my thousand something um, data points, it, it just wasn't good enough. Um, and maybe that was the case, but we'll see later that that wasn't the whole story. But Another thing to um, take away from this is that simple models such as this linear SVC um, can be extremely effective, so don't discount them. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to talk about is how to add um, features. Um, and I'm going to uh, sort of like take a little bit of a detour to talk about pipelines. So pipelines, so before what we were doing was that we were putting our data, so the row names start here, we're putting them to, through an n-gram counter um, and then using uh, a linear SVC classifier on, on that. And what I was doing before was to just um, um, sort of like um, apply a function to, to the data to get this and then apply another function to the data to get that. Um, and one thing that you can do is to actually put everything into a pipeline. So, um, so, so up to here, this is exactly the same as what we did before, but now I'm gonna make a pipeline 
of the n-gram counter and the classifier. Um, and then I can use um, the entire pipeline and do fit transform on the, on the original data. So this is going to be the road names um, and the labels um, in, in one shot instead of doing each step individually. Um, and, and that gets us the model. And then we can do the usual model.predict. So um, the, the advantage of using pipelines is that um, you, can, you can chain together a lot of different steps um, really easily and have this single object that you can save and like, reuse later. Um, and it's very readable. So um, I recommend using pipelines. So what do we do when we want to add our, a new feature that's sort of like our, our own feature and not, um, not using like count factorizer to count the number of n-grams? So, um, so one of the features that I thought to add was um, to count the number of words in the road name. Um, and the reason that I thought this, was be, was, this might be useful was that the more words you have, the more likely it's going to be to be of Chinese origin, right? Because um, Chinese names often have two or three uh, words in them. Um, so what I need is a new data transformer that takes road names and outputs this number. Okay? So, um, so how do you write your own transformers? So you can um, write your own transformer class. Um, so this was a, uh, so this is a very generic transformer class that I wrote. Um, um, I just called it apply transform. And what transformers need to do is they need to have a transform uh, function that actually takes your um, NumPy array x and outputs another NumPy array. Um, and it also needs this fit, f uh, fit method, but um, it's almost always the same. It just returns self. It doesn't need to do anything else. So um, what apply transform does is that it's going to apply a function f element-wise to a NumPy array. And so when I, um, so I can make a word count pipeline that takes, um, that takes row names and, um, and returns the number of words in each row name. Okay. So we want to use this uh, word count um, transformer in parallel with the original um, n-gram counter, right? We don't want to chain them because, um, you know, that's not, that's, they're, they're both acting on the same data, which is the road name. So make, make pipeline was, uh, was, is, is always serial. So how do we put these things in parallel? And the answer is, um, is feature unions. So this is another feature of a uh, scikit-learn pipeline. And there's a function called make union that allows you to um, parallelize um, two or more um, transformers. And so what you can pass in, what you pass in can either be a transformer, such as the n-gram counter, which was, you know, um, the count factorizer is just a transformer, or you can also pass in a whole pipeline. So this could actually be two or three steps, and you could put them in parallel. Okay, so we make a pipeline out of this, um, out of these uh, parallel transformers and the classifier, and that's the, the complete set of steps that we need to do in order to, um, in order to, uh, in order to make our model M. Um, this is another useful transformer. So sometimes your data is going to have um, um, several, your, your NumPy array is going to have several, um, several columns in it. And sometimes you want your, um, you only want to operate on a single column or several columns. And you can actually use um, this column selector transformer to um, to just select out the columns you want and then chain that to another transformer that acts just on those columns and, and goes, from, goes on from there. Okay, so what additional features did I try? So um, this, is the, this is like the stage in, um, in machine learning where you really get to use your domain knowledge. Um, so one, so the, one of the things was, um, like, like I said before, number of words in the row name. Another thing that I thought to use was the average length of the words. So for example, Indian names tend to be quite long. Um, Chinese, words, uh, Chinese names tend to have each word quite short. Um, so I thought this might be a discriminative feature. Um, another one was whether all of the words were in the dictionary. So, if, um, so remember there was the generic label. Um, so, if, so 
Market Street. Um, the word market is definitely going to be in a dictionary. So, uh, so all of the words being in a dictionary is a good predictor that it's a generic um, class. Another one um, which is not directly inherited from the um, street name is whether the road type is Malay. So um, streets in Singapore usually end in streets or road, um, just like here. But there's also streets that start with um, jalan, which is the Malay word for street, and lorong, which is, I think, the Malay word for lane. And so, and streets that, have, that start with jalan or lorong um, have a very, very high probability of being Malay. So this is also a good, um, a good uh, feature to use. So I added these features on top of the n-grams and um, plotted how, how we did. Um, so this purple line at the bottom is just n-grams. So, um, and then the next step that I did was to add um, whether it was the Malay road tag, uh, whether it had the Malay road type or not. And that brought me up a, a few percentage points um, to, to here is the green one. And then I added um, the average word length and the number of words, and that didn't increase, um, increase the accuracy by very much. And, um, and then I tried um, all of the word, whether all of the words were in the dictionary, adding that feature, and we got quite a big boost in accuracy. So um, what's the takeaway from this? So um, why I think that um, the average word length and the um, number of words in, um, didn't add that much uh, to the accuracy was that we were sort of duplicating old information. This was sort of encoded in the, um, in the n-grams. So, um, but when we added fresh information that wasn't in the n-grams, such as whether it had the Malay uh, road type or whether all of the words were in the dictionary, these are things that couldn't possibly be in the n-grams. So um, adding this fresh information really helped um, to improve the model. Okay, the next thing we can do is to try feature selection. So this is when you call the features um, and you discard the ones that aren't very predictive. Um, in general, it said that this reduces the risk of overfitting um, to your training data. So this is when you predict that you fit to the training data so well that you can't generalize to the testing data um, and that this will improve accuracy. Um, so um, scikit-learn comes with a bunch of feature selection methods such as select percentile, L1-based feature selection, principal components analysis, there are many more. These are the ones that I tried. Um, and how you use them is basically you can slot them into your feature pipeline after you've created your feature matrix and before you do the classifier. And what I found was that it didn't help at all for me. Um, um, basically, the highest performing one, this orange line up here, um, is the one where there's no feature selection going on at all. Um, so I don't want to say that, I, I'm not saying that feature selection is, um, is, is, is a bad thing to do, um, but it, does, it de definitely doesn't necessarily help. And um, you probably want to think about using it when your model is definitely overfitting to the data, or you really have a very large number of features that, you know, it, so it's taking a long time to train your classifier. But um, otherwise, um, you know, it's probably not the first thing that I'll reach for. Okay, and the last thing that I tried was um, hyperparameter tuning. Um, so, um, so basically, each classifier comes with a bunch of um, hyperparameters, where that will um, and changing them will affect how it learns the mapping. So, um, in order to search be between all of these uh, hyperparameter settings, Scikit-Learn gives uh, this. Um, grid search CV function. And what, what it does is that it will take uh, the pipeline that you've already made. So this is, uh, I'm just using this ngram pipeline and SVC. And um, I'm doing a grid search on the pipeline. And I'm going to pass it this parameter grid. So this, these are the parameters that I want it to experiment with. So um, SVC has a, a, a few different parameters. One of them is C, one of them is gamma. So these are the different, uh, maybe like five different settings that I want um, of um, the C variable and uh, a bunch of different settings of the gamma variable. And it'll test every combination of these and see how well, um, how well it does, um, how, how well each of them does. 
And once you've um, fit it to the X train and Y train, you can query it for the best parameters. And what it came out with was a gamma, um, a gamma value of 0.001 and a C value of 100. And then you can pass these back in again, and you can make your pipeline now from the Ngram pipeline in SVC with C set to 100 and gamma set to 0 0.001. And um, I didn't play with, around with this a huge amount. It's actually really time consuming, but it actually did really, really well. Uh, so um, I didn't show you before, but uh, when I tried support vector classifiers using the um, default um, radio basis function kernel, um, it was one of the worst performing along with, the, um, along with uh, random force. But when I just did this hyperparameter tuning, I got this huge jump in accuracy. So even though it was time consuming, it seems like doing this hyperparameter tuning is worth it, especially, I'm not sure if it's especially, but um, it certainly worked well on this complex model. Okay, um, so when I first uh, looked at doing grid search, um, I was actually really, really um, confused about how to pick the parameter grid. I was like, how do you know which parameter, which hyperparameters to tune? And how do you know what, what settings to try? Um, and in the abstract, I promised that I would say something, um, something about this. Um, and I think I was hoping that by now I would know something more, um, um, something more, uh, have something deep to say about it, but um, actually I don't. So I'm just gonna say that um, I think when it comes to picking this hyperparameter grid, um, this is sort of like part of the art of machine learning and um, really understanding how the classifier works will help. So um, in particular, you want to understand like what parameters change, how powerful the model is, you might want to use these. Um, and as for the values, um, um, go big, so pick the logarithmically spaced values. If you want to, if you want, you can, um, you can do a second pass of grid search um, afterwards, just searching around um, in the sort of local vicinity of the values that you found that were the best. Um, but in general, pick um, logarithmically spaced values. Unless it's bounded, so sometimes, you know, it's, it's just supposed to take a value between zero and one, and then it's a no-brainer, just pick equally spaced values. Um, so that's one, one way you can do it, understand how the classifier works. And the other way is to just shamelessly copy, uh, which is what I've been doing when I do a hyperparameter search. I just see what other people have done on GitHub. Um, and in fact, um, if you look at um, the, um, the manuals for the libraries that linear SVC and SVC are based on, which is um, liblinear and libsvm, these are C um, libraries, um, they actually have recommendations for how to set, uh, for what hyperparameters to try. Um, so, so you could just follow what they say. Okay, so, um, so basically, um, I think I, I, I stopped more or less when I got to about 77% accuracy, and that was good enough for me, and I um, hand-corrected the rest of the data, and then it was time to make the map. So, um, so, so before I had, um, if you remember, the GeoJSON data with all of the different roads, and now I have this classification data, which is uh, sort of a shorter matrix, and it's really easy to merge those two using pandas. So um, just merge, um, it provides this merge function, and when you pass it how equals left, it, it's basically the equivalent of doing a SQL left join. Um, so that's how I got the final data. And I put it into tau mill, which is this sort of GUI um, over Mapnik, um, which is a C++ library for plotting, um, for plotting maps. And it's pretty good. So basically, all I needed to do was to add my data set and to define some, um, what they call Carto CSS. And this is what Carto CSS looks like. So basically, I said, um, if the classification was Malay, made the line color green, um, it's, really, it's really simple to do. So, um, so I had my map, and, um, and when I looked at it, you know, if you remember um, how it looked, you really do see a lot of clumping um, in the data, so that's kind of nice. Okay, so let me summarize um, um, my findings, basically. So um, I've tried five different ways of improving the classifier. 
Um, and the two that gave me the most bang for the buck were understanding the data and adding informative features based on it, and also tuning the hyperparameters. So it was really time consuming, but it was worth it. Um, also, adding more data helped, but um, you know, always watch out for plateauing. And you can use feature selection if your model is overfitting, um, or if you have a large number of features. It didn't help me, it actually made things worse, but yeah. And um, the other thing was don't discount the simple classifiers. So remember um, linear SVC, one of doing the best out of all the default classifiers. But you know, if you have the data to back them up, why not try the more powerful ones? And in particular, you know, when you tune the hyperparameters, they may actually do pretty well. Okay, so yeah, that's it. Um, and I have some links, um, but you can't actually access the links. But yeah, the map is online. Um, and you can look at it. Yeah. So, I'm done. Thank you. Sorry? Links. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention this. But, um, so, I found these two resources really, really useful. Um, um, when, so this was really useful for understanding pipelines and feature unions. And um, the scikit-learn tutorial at SciPy 2013 has really a lot of good stuff about, um, about tuning, tuning models. Which ones needed to be hand-corrected? Okay, yeah, so, so um, basically, I think just having grown up in Singapore, I have a sense of um, which ones, like, of what each thing should be. So I, I know what, like, Malay words look like, and I know what Malay names look like, I know what the Chinese names look like. And there were maybe 5 to 10% of them were, um, I, I, I couldn't tell, and then I had to actually go and do some, like, his, like historical research and figure out who this road was named after and stuff like that. Um, so I was comparing it to, to data that I had already labeled myself. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking of things like random forest, and um, well, I guess I'm thinking mostly of SVC. So if you take the linear SVC, it can only um, different, that can only differentiate data that's um, sort of like linearly separable, um, more or less. But um, once you use these other like radial basis functions and stuff, you can actually make these really like curvy um, uh, sort of classification boundaries and you can sort of like isolate different parts. So it's a lot more powerful in the sense that it can discriminate a larger, uh, larger like sets of data. I don't mean larger sets, um, as in there's more data, but um, um, there's like a superset of types of data that you can differentiate. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So, in, in, in some areas, I think that that would be the case, but it, so like the places where it, there's still private housing, maybe it would still be the case. But um, in most in most areas, Singapore has become like really, really um, homogenous. So, um, um, so probably not. One thing I do want to explore is like whether it correlates well with like how people feel about like the neighborhood boundaries. So, so if you go back to um, this map here. So this is my area of Singapore. Um, and I have this really strong feeling that sort of um, once the names start getting different, um, then it's not really my neighborhood anymore. Yeah, like once it gets to be like the Chinese area or the Malay area. Uh, yeah, so, so um, I think there might be some correlation with that maybe. Um, Uh, 
Um, I think some, some will be much longer than others. So the new SVC is very, very fast. Um, once you move to like RBF, I think it's like N squared. It, um, so, so it's going to take longer. Um, it was mostly seconds. I mean, it was just 1,700. Um, well, in, in most cases, even less than that. So, so most of the time, it was just seconds. But um, once you start trying, so like different, lots of different combinations. Um, for example, when you're doing the um, uh, uh, hyperparameter tuning, that's when it really gets um, time consuming because it's basically fitting the classifier over and over again. So. Um, that's, that's sort of when things get hairy. Um, I can't really remember, um, but it was just like five. So, so in this case, I think I only tuned two parameters. Um, and I think I did just, just to make sure that it was sort of generalizable, I, I did it 10 times each. Um, I remember being really impatient while it happened, but it probably was just a few minutes, um, maybe 10 minutes or something like that. I don't, but I can't really remember. It was a while ago, sorry. Um, so you can get it straight from OpenStreetMap itself um, if your area isn't covered by Metro Extracts, and you can in fact like draw this your own bounding box and download all the data that's within that. Um, so for mapping data, that's probably one of the best sources, especially in areas where um, other mapping data isn't free. So I think in the U.S., mapping data like that's by the Geological Survey or whoever they are um, is supposed to be free. But in Singapore, um, this road data is not free, and it, and all of this open stream map data is entirely from volunteers, um, you know, riding around on bicycles and things, and like using a GPS to map the, the roads. So. Right. Right. Yeah. So so this is good in, in the sense it's very open. I mean, the fact that it's um, that it's so open also is sort of a bad thing in a way because, I mean, there's a lot of like errors in the data that I had to like manually correct. Um, like I found roads that didn't, didn't exist that I think someone just named after himself. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. Um, so, so you have to be careful of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for coming.